Thank you for coming out this evening to what I think must be the most interestingly and evocatively titled torch event I've ever had the privilege to introduce, Calculus of the Nervous System. My name is Philip Bullock. I am Director of Torch, the Oxford Research Centre in the Humanities, and it's a great privilege to be able to have played some small parts in bringing to get this evening together. Before I begin with the introduction to what's going to happen, I should ask you to note this is, of course, a historic venue. We're going to be hearing some cutting-edge music in what was a cutting-edge building many centuries ago. So please uh, be careful when moving around, watch out for the pipes beneath you, and when you leave, please do take care. Also, if there were to be an emergency, the exit is that way. Please also turn your phones off. That would be a technological intrusion too far, I think, in what we're going to hear. We should run to about 9.30. It's always a little bit hard to tell when academics start talking and uh, we've got this wonderful new programme. There will be no interval. It will run through, and I'll talk a little bit about the structure in a moment. So welcome, and I first want to begin with thanks. Thanks to the Britain Symphonia for making time in their busy schedule, for coming to Oxford, for William Cole and for Martin Fontenelle-Simmons, who will also be conducting and singing. Thank you to Torch and its staff for the administrative help and for Wadham for hosting us in this glorious venue. We're going to be hearing a sequence of wonderful pieces. It's been a great joy to be in the room today listening to the rehearsals. But I just wanted to start with a citation from Emily Howard. Um, I haven't run this past her, so I hope it's okay, but I took it from the website. Writing music tends to be a solitary act. I find it deeply rewarding creatively to balance this necessary alone time by collaborating and having conversations with people who have wide-ranging interests and experiences. You never know when somebody is going to say something that will spark the imagination, and it is often, uh, even unusually, usually in the most unexpected situations. And the spirit of collaboration, of serendipity, and of collegiality runs through everything that we're going to be doing today. In addition to hearing our compositions, uh, we are also going to have contributions from Robert Laidlaw, doctoral student researching AI-assisted composition as part of PRISM. PRISM is the Centre for Practice and Research in Science and Music, directed by Emily at the Royal Northern College of Music. We will also have David Duro, Professor of E-Research here at the University of Oxford, and Ursula Martin, Visiting Professor of Maths, also at the University of Oxford. The format will be, we'll hear the first two pieces, the Ada Sketches, and then Wild Clematis in Winter. There'll be then a short discussion involving uh, several uh, of the participants. We'll then hear Alter, and we will then finish. Uh, we'll have another little uh, discussion, and then we will finish with uh, the final piece. Enough of me, although you'll be seeing a little bit of me later. It's now time to welcome the, some of the performers of the Britain Symphonia who will uh, introduce us, who will perform for us the first of this evening's pieces. The powers follow Fibonacci.
Because that man, because that would be a half to it. Maybe we just work with one arm, pass it down, and let's quit while we're ahead. I'm trying to work out how to divide three into four, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's a real pleasure just to spend a little time talking to the people behind these kind of creations. And I have this and the power of the to me, I've got a lot of time, I've got data wrong. Um, the first piece is being heard, the eight sketches, and the wild characters, which, which I should say is not a lovely piece. It's a setting of Jeffrey that we thought about when we were here in Oxford, so hearing a setting of one of Oxford's professors of poetry, so you don't actually to, to, to miss it. Thank you for that suggestion. Um, can you just let me take a little bit into, into Lovelace and what she means to you and how she provided this thing right through what we're hearing this evening? So, Ada Lovelace, mathematician, um, she collaborated with Charles Babbage, who's the creator of the difference in the analytical engine, the prototype for the world's first computer. And Lovelace um, wrote some notes about, she translated the paper. Um, about this engine by Italian engineer Luigi Nelly, and um, she then appended it with some 20,000 words of notes. I'm just going to read from them. <coughs> Supposing, for instance, that the fundamental relations of pitch sounds in the science of harmony and of musical composition were susceptible of such expression and adaptations, the engine might compose elaborate and scientific pieces of music of any degree of capacity or extent. And it's that thought that's very much behind the eight sketches. Um, you hear Ed Lovelace, a mezzo soprano, um, working on an equation, and it's an equation as though it were put through this hypothetical analytical engine. She's working on it. And to my mind, she kind of has a moment, you, you might have heard to power of art, a moment where she, it's kind of a eureka moment, that she discovered something wonderful to her in a mathematical sense. And as she goes on, she starts thinking about what if um, the, these were notes rather than numbers, and that's where this kind of, different kind of creative discovery comes in. She's thinking beyond using the different engine as a mathematical calculating engine, but using it Perhaps more like on today's modern computers, so lots of things using it perhaps to create music. And then she finally has a moment of realization about what it might be, where can she fit in, you know, where will I fit in when um, the engine composes its melodies. Thank you, Emily. Talking of the engine, some of you may have seen, not quite the elephant in the room, but a <laughs> ordinary device that would be very handsome in front of the, the audio. Uh, and I think we need to hear about that because that's going to play a part in the next piece, which is Alter, uh, on West Bank Prison Team, led by uh, Rob Lane. So, can you perhaps tell me just first about this machine and where it comes from and what it's doing, and maybe what we'll hear? Uh, yeah, sure. This is called the Lovelace engine, this um, instrument you see behind you. And uh, it was uh, designed uh, by uh, one of our collaborators for the, the Prison Team Commission from Cambridge Design Partnership. Um, and the reason it's, it's here on stage, you can see it, is, um, is because we wanted to link together, um, like what Emily was saying, the, uh, the idea of the kinds of computers and the kinds of mathematics and the kind of computing and algorithms that um, maybe Lovelace and contemporaries were thinking could eventually compose elaborate and scientific pieces of music for many degree of complexity or extent. Um, and uh, try to link those with our modern day computers. So the piece also has a lot of um, artificial intelligence processes behind all sorts of its um, areas of composition. And I really wanted something theatrical and you know that the audience could really see and that you could really play with sounded and looked like these sort of Victorian engines, but actually was linked to um, you know, the very real artificial intelligence we have today. Um, so let's grab the mic back. Um, the, we don't know to the program, but the piece has, of course, some text to it. Um, so maybe they'd like to ask you to, to comment a little bit about what people might maybe hear extract of the text from, actually to find out how the text is produced. Thanks, Mike. Yes, so in the uh, modern day, can you take the mic up? You hear a lot about artificial intelligence. <laughs> and uh, artificial intelligence tends to be around for a long time. What's changed is we have data, we have much more powerful computers. 
So one of the things you can do is train artificial intelligence on a body of literature or text, and then you can prompt it, as we say, and it will generate some more text, a complete text that you've given it. So the, the common examples of this, you can find them on the web, train the language model on Wikipedia, which is great, but not what they love it. Really. So we worked with um, the Electronic Enlightenment Project in the Modern Library, uh, where they have a corpus of correspondence going into the 19th century. We trained our AI on 19th century correspondence, and on Lovelace's correspondence. Uh, we used that to generate some of the text. In fact, we then brought in a 21st century AI as well, so there are two AIs going on there. I'll hand over to Rob to give you an example. <laughs> um, so the piece is in, it, it, as it says in the program, you might not have time to uh, read that. It's in uh, three uh, sections, the text and the music, and, and each, as David just alluded to, um, the model or AI builds on the last model that's feed in the result from the last section to the next section. Um, so um, these lines are, are penned by AI, so enjoy it. Um, I cannot explain this step, but I have now altered my mind. It seems to me as clear as possible. On looking over my development again very carefully, I am inclined to think I am completely wrong in my application. That's in step one. In step two, we feed in that last line to begin the next uh, phase. I was completely wrong in my application of the numbers. Yet still I am in a charming state of confusion. There is at times a half angry and dreadful feeling, and altogether I cannot think of much pleasure in my mind. Am I myself? If I have any other way of life, I cannot get